Hi, I'm Dr. Jared Gardner, and today we're going to look at a very nice example of a relatively common disease called tinea versicolor, or I think the more modern name that people are preferring nowadays is pityriasis versicolor. And this is a type of fungal infection on the skin surface. But look, right here we've got something else. This is actually a little, little tiny baby seborrheic keratosis, just an incidental finding. See how it's at the very edge of the shave? It's a good lesson, though. Don't find one one uh, disease, one answer on a biopsy and just stop looking. Always look at the rest of the biopsy because you can have multiple things present. As we get away from the seb, look what happens. The epidermis out here doesn't look too exciting, but there's kind of more keratin at the top than normal. More loose, flaky surface keratin. Normally the stratum corneum is not this thick, but here we have this orthokeratin, this hyperkeratosis without retained nuclei. And whenever I see skin that looks relatively normal, or maybe like here we've got some a little bit of inflammation around the vessels, some lymphocytes, also some pigment dropout uh, there, melanin pigment. But when I see skin that has a thick stratum corneum, uh, right away I want to think about fungal infections like true tinea or dermatophytosis, which is called by, caused by dermatophyte fungi, also um, tinea versicolor or pityriasis versicolor, which is what we have here. So I've not shown you the fungus yet, but look, let's go see them. Here they are. At this opening of a hair follicle, you can really see a bunch of the keratins kind of lifted and flaked off here. And in the keratin, even though we're not looking at a fungus stain, we're looking at a hematoxylin and eosin, a, a regular H&E stain. Look, the organisms are easily visible. And the thing I like about tinea versicolor is the organisms are blue or purple almost always on H&E. Now contrast that to to dermatophytosis or, or the true type of tinea that's caused by dermatophyte fungus, their fungal hyphae are in my laboratory and on most H&Es I've seen, they're usually clear, have very little color. I've occasionally seen exceptions, but most of the dermatophyte fungus that I see are clear, um, whereas um, you really don't usually need to do a fungus stain to identify the fungi of tinea versicolor. So these fungal organisms are Malassezia. That's their genus. Malassezia furfur is the one that is always talked about, but actually there's a whole uh, handful of different species uh, that can cause this uh, infection. And um, the, uh, the uh, organisms here have two forms. You have round forms, round little circles here that are yeast structures, okay? And you can even see, how do you know? Oops, that's as close as we can get. You can tell it's a yeast, hopefully it's showing up when you see a round structure that's got a little bud coming off to the side. Fungi can also make round forms called spores or canidia. Some, sometimes the fungus do that. Um, we don't, it's, it's a more complicated than we're going into in this video, but the one trick that I like to tell true yeast is that a true yeast organism should, if you find some budding like that, oh, here's another one budding right there. It's making a mama making a little baby yeast, or actually, I guess it's a sister making a sister yeast since they're like kind of uh, cloning of each other. But in any case, we have those round structures, but then we also have hyphae, elongated tubes here. And the hyphae, um, people say, these look like spaghetti noodles, and then these um, round yeast look like meatballs. So this is the classic spaghetti and meatball appearance. Gross. Why do we have to make everything about food and pathology? Um, but uh, that is actually a, a useful thing to remember, though, that the yeast form of Malassezia, oh, and by the way, in the past, Malassezia was known as Pitarosporum, because we have to rename everything in medicine and usually give it several names, but Pitarosporum or Malassezia, um, these organisms live on our skin surface of pretty much everyone. I, I see these yeast on the surface of the skin on many patients every single day who are getting biopsies for other things like skin cancers or moles and stuff like that. And so when you just see the round blue yeast, and they usually like to live in the opening of a hair follicle like this, and I'll tell you why in a minute. But when we see those, that's just a normal finding, normal skin, basically a commensal organism that just lives as part of our skin flora. So I don't even mention that in my report because it's A, you see it all the time and it doesn't mean anything. It's not of any value. And where you'll see them, like I said, you can see them in the openings of hair follicles. And also you can see them over the surface of um, skin lesions or growths um, like seborrheic keratoses or occasionally actinic keratosis or squamous cell carcinoma, keratinocytic lesions that are producing a lot of extra keratin. So as you can put together here, these organisms like to live in thick areas of keratin. The reason is, is that they need lipids. Fatty acids uh, is one of their nutrients that they need. Um, and I guess other fungi either don't or don't need it as much, but these really need the oil from our sebaceous secretions. So the sebum 
coming up from these sebaceous glands. All those little clear bubbles in these sebacytes are filled with lipid, of course, kind of fatty substance. And as the cells die and slough off into the duct and come into the hair follicle, we can't see it because it's out of the plane of section here. And then that sebaceous secretion or the oils on our skin, of course, um, those skin oils from the sebaceous glands come up here and they get kind of trapped in these extra areas of keratin, uh, whether it's in a hair follicle opening or on the top of a seborrheic keratosis. And then the fungus can thrive there in its nice, fatty, oily home. Isn't that nice? And a nice little uh, uh, fun tip to, to you know impress your friends with at cocktail parties once we go back to having those. Um, maybe this is why I don't have friends uh, anymore, or maybe it's because I have young kids, but in any case, you can tell your friends that, uh, the, this, uh, the organisms need the lipid to survive, and in fact, if you want to grow them in the laboratory, like on a culture dish, you're supposed to put a lipid into the culture dish, and I've heard that, I've never actually seen a lab do this, because oftentimes culture is not needed, you, you can diagnose this by looking at it usually, but you need to, you can add olive oil, um, to the culture dish to help it grow, pour some olive oil over the surface. That's what I've been told by microbiologists in the past, but I've never seen it done. But I always like to say that these really prefer extra virgin uh, olive oil, either from Italy or Spain, um, but I'm just joking. That's the kind of olive oil I like. But um, in any case, so we've gone on and on at length about this lowly little fungus, but it's kind of a fun uh, disease to see microscopically. It's easy to recognize and diagnose. Um, the spaghetti and meatball appearance like this is the classic thing. Sometimes it's hard to appreciate that in the skin though. It's really, that appearance is better seen on a skin scraping where you scrape off the flaky stuff, put it on a slide with, with potassium hydroxide and look at it under the microscope in the clinic. So when you get a, an area like this, you can see fungi here, like right here. But it's a lot harder. You can tell there are some, some yeast and there are also some hyphae. Um, but the best areas I find it, it is either a skin scraping or looking for an area like this around a follicle where a, a chunk of loose keratin is kind of flipped over and we're seeing it kind of spread out. And that's a lot better. We're basically seeing a, a piece of keratin that's flipped off of the skin surface and we're looking at it kind of cut on FOSS. Um, so like you would look at a skin scraping. All right. So what else uh, should we, we tell you? This was going to be like a two minute video, but now that we're going on 10, I might as well expound some more so that you know everything you can know about these little malassezia or pterosporum fungus. Okay. The, the one feature that people like to say is that the, the, there's one other fungus that can look a lot like this, and that's candida. Candida yeast, candida albicans, which causes yeast infections like of the, the vulva and vagina and mucosal sites, and you can also see it in the mouth and around the lips. Um, it can look, to me, very similar, if not essentially identical microscopically. It has yeast, and it also has hyphae or pseudohyphae. And I, the, to me, there's no way under a microscope on a slide like this to tell apart a true hypha or a pseudohyphae. And actually, I learned not long ago that, that candida can make both pseudohyphae and true hyphae. Some microbiologist is going to have to explain to me um, how to, to tell those apart. But in any case, they can look very similar to this. So one uh, trick that people have said is that the, the Malassezia fungus in uh, – uh, Pityriasis versicolor, tinea versicolor, is parallel to the surface of the skin. It, it surfs the waves of keratin, basically. And you can see it here kind of running along the surface. And that candida, the hyphae, are supposed to dive down into the waves rather than surfing across them. Uh-oh, but wait a second. Here's a hypha, and it's going straight down. So that, that trick is kind of cute and nice, but it doesn't always work perfectly. I find it much better. Uh, clinically, these diseases look quite different. Candida usually occurs in kind of moist sites, like in the, the uh, you know, genital area or in a mucosal site, whereas um, tinea versicolor malassezia usually is on the, the kind of the sebaceous areas, like the chest or the back, you know, on the trunk, the, the neck. And um, the, uh, so I find that that, that uh, anatomic site and also the clinical appearance is going to be the most helpful thing in sorting out if it's candida versus uh, tinea versicolor. So what do these look like clinically? Well, I pulled up a picture here, and it's kind of interesting. The clinical is that these are usually these flat uh, macules, or maybe I guess you could say they're very thin patches uh, that are often a little bit scaly, and they have a different pigment than the rest of the skin. If you have darker skin pigment normally, the patients with darker skin tend to get hypopigmentation, a 
uh, diminished pigments in the areas where the fungus is growing. And the opposite is true for patients that have light skin. When they get the fungus, they often get kind of a darker coloration. And there's actually, it's kind of complicated and, and evidently multifactorial. Um, one of the, of, for how the pigment changes happen, there's probably a variety of things that contribute to it. But one of the most, I think, uh, most uh, interesting ones and the most notable things is that these fungus, uh, these fungi make um, a substance called azelaic acid. And azelaic acid uh, basically soaks down through the epidermis and gets to the melanocytes and makes them um, slow down or reduce the amount of melanin pigment that they're, they're doing. So it kind of like knocks out the melanocytes for a while and, and, and slows them down so they're not making the normal skin pigment um, in the area anymore, which is kind of interesting. And in fact, I believe that uh, uh, there are skin lightening creams that actually um, use that azelaic acid. I don't know much about cosmetic dermatology, but I've been told that there's um, sub, uh, uh, basically treatments that can help reduce pigmentation that are derived from that acid. And the way that acid was discovered was by studies of this uh, organism, Malassezia. So that's kind of interesting. And then again, for lighter skin patients, it often produces kind of this same appearance, but the colors are flipped. The background skin is an, a light color and the, the areas of, of lesion where the fungus is growing um, have the darker color in lighter skin patients. So it's kind of interesting, but obviously this can be, um, uh, it's not a, a serious infection that causes a problem. Very, very rarely there are times where this same fungus can cause more serious infections, but, but um, in Normally, it is not, but it is, is cosmetically, you know, pretty um, uh, bothersome to patients who have it when it's extensive, especially. So, the uh, last thing I think to, to show you, I think we've talked about everything I know about this uh, disease. Oh, yes, I did forget to mention this. I started to say it and got distracted. When I just see the yeast organisms here in normal skin or in the background of, say, a, a basal cell carcinoma or a SEB or something, I don't even mention them because they're just a normal flora, in my opinion. But it's only when you see the hyphae along with the yeast, that's when you know that the, the fungus is actually growing, it's producing hyphae, and it's when the, the hyphae forms, the elongated tubular structures are present, that's when it actually is, the patient has a true tinea versicolor or pityriasis versicolor, whichever name again, that you like. So that's the key to me is I want to see the, the yeast and the hyphae, the meatballs with the spaghetti to call it um, tinea versicolor. Otherwise, it's just background um, malassezia fungus uh, just kind of hanging out there. So, and again, remember, whenever you see a thick stratum corneum like this, Always go down and look closer for fungus, and if you don't see any, consider doing a fungus stain because dermatophyte fungus, which are very hard to see on H&E, um, they often produce this thickening of orthokeratin, and sometimes with some parakeratin, on the surface of the skin. So that's like a very characteristic uh, look. Let me show you, I did just for the sake of the sake of education, I did a fungus stain, even though we clearly don't need it in this case because the organisms are already so florid, but here is... Uh, a Gamori uh, methanamine silver GMS stain that stains the fungus black and you can see them really highlighted there but again on H&E these are visible and I find that that's what's so nice about this uh, recognizing this disease is because you can see it easily on the H&E you just have to remember to look because sometimes organisms this is a very florid case with tons of organism but sometimes they can be relatively sparse uh, and focal uh, so just keep an eye out for this and see if you can spot an example of uh, pityriasis versicolor, aka tinea versicolor, in your uh, practice sometime soon. All right, well, thanks for watching. You've had uh, 13 and a half minutes of all the Malassezia pterosporum knowledge that, um, that I'm aware of, and now I've passed it on to you. Have a great day.